You're getting all worked up. No, I, I can't say that in this class because there's actually a kid named Simmer in this class. I didn't say it. All right. So this unit is fraught with new vocabulary. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger, in one of the movies, Winnie the Pooh, or somebody says something is fraught with, with terror or something, and Tigger says you just can't argue with a word like fraught. And I agree, you just can't. It's a powerful word. But all it really means is it's dangerously, dangerously so. Um, so yes, there's a lot of new vocabulary in this unit. Some of you will know some of it. Some of you will not have heard some of it. Um, but as you all know, I will be referring to all these things by their actual name, not by their fun little, you know, princess breaking out of the tower names. Okay? The first of these new words is the word set. Now, you people are familiar with the word set from when you were drawing Venn diagrams. And you have the characteristics of Bobby and the characteristics of Jeanette. And then the characteristics that they share are in the middle, right? Because for some strange reason, social studies and English have decided to steal the Venn diagram from math. Now, math, Venn diagrams, and set theory is very, very important to mathematics. And uh, it's, uh, it, it makes me a little uh, uncomfortable that English and social studies have kind of glommed onto the Venn diagram and taken it out of our purview. But I'm okay with it. I've got some distance from it. I can work with it now. So, of course, we already know what this thing is. Over here in the left circle, you would write a whole bunch of things about some character or some event in history or some crap like that. And then over here, you would write a whole bunch of things, and there would be some overlap, and you would then discuss that, right? Okay, a set is simply any amount, I was making that all one word, any amount of data. Now I say data, some of you will say data, I do not care, don't correct me, I'm not wrong and neither are you. Some people just like to say data and some people like to say data. I live in Canada, I say data. I spend a lot of time in the States, they say data. They're always correcting me. I just let it go because I'm in their country. I also don't tell them that the word is roof, not roof. I don't tell them the word is room, not room. But, you know. They have no problem telling me I'm saying it wrong when they come here. But it's beside the point. Um, so, any amount of data. Now, data is another word that I haven't been using, but you all know it. You think it means gigabytes on your phone, but no, it does not. Data is anything in math you can count. All right? Now, we don't always use numbers to do this, right? For example, in this classroom, there are 30 different <coughs> students, which we would count with numbers, but each of you have various ways I could identify you. Your name, your birthdays, your astrological signs. All those things are still data because they are indeed something that could be counted, even though we are not using numbers. Everybody cool? Yeah. Sweet. All right, next new word, an element. Now, there's white space here because we're going to put examples there in a minute. An element is any single datum. Datum is the singular of the word data, right? All of the names in this class, for example, is a, an example of a set of data, okay? One name in this class is a datum in that set. It is also an element. Any single datum, a group of elements makes 
a set. All right. So now let's go back to examples. Set is any amount of data. So for example, excuse me, names of kids in the room. In the room, because there's two O's. Right? Everybody cool? Names of kids is the set. An element is any single name. Everybody good? All right. Now, and the third one is a relation. That is any time we compare two sets of data. If we're comparing two sets of data, we have a relation. All right? Ease, bees, lemon, squeeze. Now the example of that, and we're going to use this example again later. The example of that is, I have one set of data, names of all the kids in the room, which I get before you walk in the room in September, yes? I had a class list of all of you. I didn't know who any of you were. Now, when you all come into the room, is that new data for me? Yeah, because I've never seen you before. So that's new data, yeah? So then I take the data that I have, your names, I read that out, you go here, and now I have a relation, right? Because I've related one piece of data, your name, Jewel, to second piece of data, that kid. Everybody got it? Yeah. Now, teacher school would say I am committing a, an egregious sin by referring to people as kids. I don't care. Huh? It's not. But there is a negative connotation to the word kids. You will notice that professional people, like real professional people, not people who actually do the job, but real professional people go out of their way now to call you people people or humans. That's the new sexy term. Just, yes, they say humans, so that covers everyone. I can't stand all that horse crap, right? You think I'm an old codger, I think you're kids. That's all there is to it, right? I, I know that, Riley, I'm aware of that. But many people in the industry of dealing with young people refer to use the word kids because it tends to carry negative connotations. I, of course, do not feel it carries negative connotations. I love you people because I wouldn't do this job if I didn't want to, because as you well know, the thought of spending eight hours a day doing something I hate would be kind of like stabbing myself in the eye. I wouldn't do it. I don't know why anybody does. Okay, so we're all good with this? Okay, now, what I have here is a graph. Now the first thing you need to know about graphs is this. Graphs, and I'm gonna write this in capital letters, then I'm going to highlight it. Then I'm going to put a Mrs. Bag Crumble cloud around it. Then I'm going to underline it because it's an important thing for you people to recognize. Graphs represent data. Highlight. Mrs. Bad Crumble. Underline. Sparkle. Okay, all that shape of the day stuff from grade three, yeah? You know, you walked in and the teacher had shape of the day written on the board with a cloud around it because it mattered to a grade, to a seven-year-old what they were doing at 1.45 in the afternoon. It didn't matter. Right? So, what do I mean by graphs represent data? They show it. They are not the data itself. Go back to my example. I'm going to use this all the way through. Names and kids. Anywhere on this graph, does it show me what Jordy looks like? No. no. All right? Don't mistake a graph for being a drawing of real life. Everybody cool? It represents data. Okay? And you're going to see what I mean with that a little later on. So... Put a little pin in this conversation we're having right now and be like, 
when it comes to time, when this comes back, I'll say, you remember that? You'll be all like, uh, and I'll be like, yeah. And you'll be like, uh, because some of you will screw up and draw a graph that doesn't represent data, but represents life. And then I will go kid. And then it will be negative. See what I mean there? See what I did? I brought it all. Never mind. All right. So what are my two sets of data on this graph? Connor, just give me one of them. Um, the measurement. So the set one is measurements. Now, Connor said those measurements are on the left. And that's not a mistake, but it's not 100% right. Because this is not the data, is it? When your parents put up a growth chart on the wall and measured you every six months to show how you were growing up and becoming a big person. Yes, of course, every parent does it at some point. They measure you somewhere. Come on. We got a side of the door that has every kid that lives in, every kid that spends any time in our house is on the side of our door. All our exchange students, the dog, we measured the cats. If we ever move, I'm going to have to bust off that piece and take it with me. But um, anyways, this is indeed information, yes? But it is not data from the sets, is it? This is a scale. Which every graph needs. Right? This tells us the range of the data on the graph. The actual data is indeed measurements, but it is there, 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 and there. Everybody cool? Okay. Um, what is the second set of, of data on this graph? Mantage. Right, the types O dogs. So those are the sets. Now tell me the elements. What are the elements of the set of measurements? There's 60. I got it as a little more than 10, right? A little past 10. Then what? 30, then what? 45, 45 then what? 45 again. 45 again, which you don't really need. And 80, right? Okay. And what are the types of dogs? What are the elements of that set? Hound, chihuahua. It hurts me to even write that as a dog type, so I'm only writing chi because they don't deserve the whole word. Any dog that was built shouldn't be an animal. That's just me, my personal opinion. If any of you have teacup poodles or some crap like that, that's okay. You're welcome to have that dog, and you're welcome to love it, just like you are welcome to love a pet rock if you have one. I just don't see it. I, I don't get it, but if that's your thing, that's your thing, okay? Um, I recently was walking my dog, who weighs 90 pounds and I walked past this kid and I heard this noise and I was like that kid didn't make that noise and then a dog a dog came out of his jacket because it was a little rainy and the dog couldn't be out in the rain no no I was thinking to myself if only the zombie apocalypse could happen so my dog couldn't be fed by anything so my dog could eat that dog Apologies to uh, all my fans that have, are small dog owners. What I don't like about small dogs is people with small dogs seem to think small dogs are okay everywhere. Like they'll walk into a surgery with their, oh, he's just little, it'll be fine. You know, they'll lean over to get some grapes and their dog is drooling on other people's food. Oh, he's just a little dog, it'll be okay. 
or you're walking by a little dog and the little dog goes ape poo and bites you because little dogs do that because they've all got little dog syndrome because they think they're a dog, but they're not. The only dog that's ever bit me is a little dog about the size of a rugby ball. And I say it was about the size of a rugby ball because that's how far I kicked it when it bit me. <laughs> Let's go indeed. You know what dog has never bit me? A giant dog, because giant dogs are nice. And if giant dogs behaved the way little dogs behaved, they would all be put to sleep. But little dogs, oh, it gets little, it's okay. <laughs> Shut up. Anyways, back to math. Now, do I have a relationship here? Yeah, of course I do, because I'm comparing one set of data, types of dog, to another set of data, the height of the dog. Everybody good? Excellent. Now, keep this in your head because you've got to turn your page. A function. Next new word. Now, some of you have heard that word before. A function is a specific type of relation. So, a function is a relation in that I am comparing two types of data. But, in a function, a specific type of relation which I should have put in which, in which each element relates to a unique element in the second set. So, everybody's got that written down, I trust? All right, so let's have a look back at the relationship that we have here. If you don't have it written down, that page is coming right back, don't worry. What is the relationship between elements in the first column here. Hound relates to what height? 60. 60. Ease, bees, lemon, squeezy, yeah? Okay. Chihuahua relates to 11. Yeah? Corgi, which I, I don't mind a corgi. They're a little weird looking with their normal sized body and tiny little stubby legs. But I am the corgi of the human world because I have a normal sized body and little tiny stubby legs. Um, so I feel for corgis. Yes, indeed. Um, labs are 45. Shepherds are 45. And Malamutes are, what is it, 80 or 90? 80. Now, <coughs> Let us observe. Does each element in each set relate to a unique element in the second set? Well, hound is 60, right? That's unique. What dog is 60 centimeters tall? How tall is a hound? Perfect. What dog is 11 centimeters tall? How tall is a chihuahua? Wow, you guys are brilliant. You're on fire. And it's Monday morning, kind of. For me, it is. What dog's 30 centimeters tall? How tall is a corgi? What dog's 45 centimeters tall? No, I said what dog? Guh. You can only name one. No, you're wrong. Yeah, which one am I thinking of? No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Oh. No, I can't. I said, what dog? Go? Well, so continue to argue while you hear the point I'm trying to make. Are they uniquely related? No, no because you do not know of which dog I speak. Aye? Aye. Aye. So let us move on then. Brussels sprouts. Are they are. So but, but, but. I was in a store on Saturday 
and they had a sign up, Brussels sprouts. And I was like, talking to my wife, those are disgusting. She's like, I know you don't like Brussels sprouts. I don't like them either, blah, blah, blah. We walked around the corner to the other side where the Brussels sprouts were actually there. And they were not selling little Brussels sprouts like they sell here. They were selling Brussels sprout trees. Did you know that they grow on trees? I did not. Something like this long, green, with a bunch of little Brussels sprouts on it. And you cut them off. I had never seen that before. I was like, damn, man, I would almost buy that and eat that because that is so damn cool. (laughs) And then I remembered, no, because they taste like bomb. They don't really. If you roast them, apparently they're delicious. I don't mind them when they're roasted with olive oil and honey and seasonings. But then you might as well, I mean, you could roast a shoe with enough olive oil and honey and seasoning. But, oh, this is tasty. Nom, 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 nom. Not because the shoe is tasty, no, because the olive oil seasonings and honey are tasty. I mean, really, if you warmed up olive oil seasonings and honey, you would just drink it and be like, damn, that's good. Doesn't matter what it's on. All right, so. How did that happen? Oh, Brussels sprouts instead of cabbages. All right, so number one here. Do I have a relation? Of course I do. Why? What is number one ask? Yes, Mantage. Let's go. No, dude. I want to know why it's a relation. So, so, but why, what makes that a relation? What are, Mantoj? Pardon me? Well, of course it does. But to have a relation, I must compare two sets. Yes, Avnor, what are the two sets I am comparing? Um, the the Months is set one. And what is set two? Days. Okay. So how many elements are there in the first set? 12, because there are only 12 months, yes? So there are 12 elements. And, excuse me, I will uh, enter just the first couple. Jan, Feb, March, April, right? And then so on. We know the rest. Now, how many elements are in the second set? No, no. 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 You do know how many days can there be in a month? There is 30 or 31 or 28 or 29. <clears throat> now, some wise ass here always says, well, technically, Mr. Myers, there are 29 days on every month. <laughs> If that was bubbling up to the top of your consciousness to make that joke, simmer down. Because I want to hear it. Because obviously, from a mathematical standpoint, that is not valid here, yes? All right. Now, Simmer, I had to say that because I used bubbling up, right? Like boiling, all right? So, all right. So now, let's, let's actually do the relation. What element from set two does January relate to? What element from set two does February relate to? 28 and 29. What does March relate to? 31. What does April relate to? 30. Now you can see that this cannot be a function, can it? Because February has two possible outcomes, right? Have any of you actually met a kid or an adult that was born on February 29th? Do you always make fun of them every four years and say, hey, you just turned one? Okay. Well, we do. Because it's their first birthday, right? Because technically. But person born on leap day should argue that they should get one, uh, like, one hundred thousandth of their present every single day. Because, of course, we are building to a leap day. We owe that person that day. 
because days are only 23 hours and 56 minutes. We've had this discussion. A day is only 23 hours and 56 minutes. That is why we have to have leap day every four years. Because in the course of four years, that four minutes adds up to an entire day. That's why we have to have leap day. That's why leap day should be a holiday for everyone because they have already earned that day by spending 24 hours a day working when really a day is only 23 hours and 56 minutes long. Now, sadly, in 2020, leap day is going to be a Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. So we all have it off anyway. But next one, 2024, whew, remember, you're owed that day. You've already paid for it. Don't try to tell your boss that. They will say, screw you, be at work. But, you know. So everybody understands this is not a function, so this is a relation. Why? Because the month of February has two possible outcomes. Now, at the end of this page, I'm going to hit throw out some more vocabulary, but I don't want to do that until uh, after. Actually, I'm going to do it right after we do number two. So number two, this is again that same one I was doing. Every name on my class relates to a student in my class. What is set one? Names, okay. And what is set to? The actual student, right? So that student right there, student one, right? So in my class, pretend that everyone's here. How many students, how many elements are in this set? 30. One to 30, agreed? And then in that case, there is also going to be 30 names, right? Now, is this a relation or a function? Or does it depend? It depends upon what? It depends on a, something about the names. If I go by first name, is this a function? Why? No one's name is the same. If I go by last name only, is this a function? In this case, no. Why? Because what? There's three gills. There's two auroras. Name, I'm saying that wrong, but it won't work, will it? If I go by first and last name, does it work? Yes. yes. Almost always, except a couple of years ago when I had two Jazpreet gills in the class who even had the same middle name. Yes, I know that, but I know that, but some kid always says, they had the same name, even the middle name? I was like, yes. <laughs> so yeah, they had the exact same. And they were in the same class two years in a row. It was very frustrating. And they're in my homeroom. So fortunately, they both know their student numbers, so we can go by that. But, so everybody cool? So this depends, right? In this class, because nobody shares a first name, this is a function. Because every kid has a unique name. I use the word unique because uh, there's a book and a movie out called Freakonomics in which uh, a historian and a mathematician study data and they make relate correlations between things. And they have an episode or a chapter in the book on names, about how your name is actually a very powerful thing. They made two resumes, exactly the same. One guy was named John Williams. This is a fake person. And the other guy was named like Tyrone P. Weathers or something. And why did they choose John Williams and Tyrone P. Weathers? Because John Williams is a white guy name. And Tyrone is a black guy name. And they sent the, ep the resumes out to companies. And guess what happened? 
John Williams got plenty of calls for interviews. The exact same resume with a different name got almost none. So the argument was your name actually, even though you have no control over it, can forecast your destiny a little bit, which is kind of freaky when you think about it. And they were using that as a reason for why names like, uh, no, 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 no. They were using it for names like uh, um, Brittany and, and names like that that are now kind of associated with not super rich people. But back in the 50s, only rich people named their kids that. So over the course of the last century in America, people started taking those rich person names and giving them to regular people. And then rich people started taking names. Like, it just changed names around. It's, it's, a, it's on YouTube or Netflix. Watch Freakonomics. It's really cool. It's called Freakonomics, spelt that way. It's really neat, even that episode. But the reason I bring it up is... This name, in their research, they found something like 256 unique spellings of the name unique. In an effort for people to name their child a unique name, they found 250 ways to spell unique. Some of them like this. Uh... Unique, like, and it was. It's it's a funny. It's a really interesting movie. It's a better book, but nobody's going to read a whole book on. Like, I know who I'm dealing with. See the movie. Um, but it's really cool. All right, so we're done there. Now, here is the next thing I wanted to put on. This is new stuff. Think back in the day, back to about grade six, your math textbook, and remember this drawing. It looked something like this. There would be a shape, and there would be like a funnel on the top. And then there would be an arrow, and then there would be some different shape with like plus three, and then some different shape with like minus seven, and some different shape with times four, and then another box with another funnel, and you dropped in a seven, added three, took away seven, multiplied by four, and you got out uh, 10, 10 minus seven is three, three times four, and you got out 12. You've seen this, yes, some of you? Yeah. Some of you won't have it, depends on what math textbooks you had growing up. Um, well, growing up, like three years ago. Um, if you had old textbooks, they had these things in them, and they called them function machines. And this number was an input, right? Because you dropped a 7 into the function machine. And then usually there were like robots and things drawn behind it. Because that was really futuristic. And everyone's like, ooh, yeah, robots. Robots are building the 7. And then, uh, shut up. It's so dumb. You're doing math. Anyways. And 12 became the output. Now this is called a function machine. Because whatever you put in here will always be a unique output here. There is no other number I could drop in here and get 12 if I follow these rules. Does everybody understand? That's what makes it a function. So this, that's new vocab for you. Inputs and outputs. So all of these, you could say January was the input, 31 was the output. Everybody cool? Because if I say 31... You know, I've, you, you wouldn't even know what I'm talking about. But if I say January, eventually you guys would say, oh, there's 31 days in it. Like you would just say stuff about January that you know. Everybody understand? But if I just say 31, the chance of somebody in this room saying, oh, it's a number of days in January are pretty darn slim. Cool? All right. So it's a relationship because each input gives a unique output. So that's more new vocab. Everybody still cool? All right. You're not going to have any work today to speak of, I don't think. It's all this type of stuff. So don't worry too much about it. 
more new words, but you know this already because I heard people talking about how they didn't like this unit last year. So I am sure that you have heard of these terms, yes? No? Okay. Some people say yes, some people say no, no problem. Because as always, I didn't teach you in grade 9, so I have no idea what you're bringing to the party, so you're going to hear it anyway. Independent variable. First of all, what is a variable? And any, anybody who says X, I'm going to stab myself in the eye, so don't do it. What is a variable? Uh, unknown. Good. Uh, unknown value. Good. Montage. Pardon me? Ooh, placeholder. Nice. Anybody else? Okay. A variable is... Oh, yes, Jordy? Okay. A variable actually means what it means in English. It means something that can change. Okay? Because if I write it as an unknown value, 7x plus 2 equals 9, right? Then, yeah, it's an unknown value. But if I write it as 3x plus 4 equals uh, 13, that x is no longer that x, is it? So a variable is something that can change. Everybody cool? All right. What does independent mean in English? Alone, right? Are any of you independent? No, of course not. You depend upon your parents, upon the school, upon a lot of things, yes? Okay. I am significantly more independent than you, but not totally independent. Everybody understands, right? I need this place so I can get money for food and such, yeah? All right. So everybody understands what independent means. Everybody understands what variable means. So what do you think an independent variable is? A variable that can stand alone, and, of course, it will change, right? So let's think about these two examples I just gave, right? In the first one, I had two things that could change, yes? The month that I was speaking of or the number of days in the month, yes? Which of those would you deem to be independent? The RJ. The month. the month, of course. Because, because of what I was just saying, right? If I said January... That puts a bunch of stuff right in your head, yes? All kinds of things, right? And January is always January, yes? If I say January, all of you know exactly of what I'm speaking, right? If I say 31, what could I be speaking of? Anything, absolutely, Riley. Absolutely anything, right? Okay, so we're all comfortable with that, yeah? All right. So an independent variable, I like to define it as follows. The variable that everyone shares. Like it's the same for all of us. And when I say January, we all know what I mean, right? If I say it's going to take an hour to get there, we all know what that means. If I say there's traffic, I don't know how many hours it's going to take to get there. You have, you can do something with that, yes? All right. The dependent variable is much ease, more easily defined. The dependent variable, just like it says, depends on what value values are assigned to the independent variable. So if I tell you we are going to compare months and days that are in a month, like we have done on this page, and I say 31, can you tell me what month I speak of? No, of course not. Why? Because it could be October, it could be December, it could be January, it could be July, it could be August, it could be March, it could be May, right? You can't do it, right? But if I say March, how many days are in it? 31, done. March is independent. We all know what March means. 
And the number of days, we have four choices, 30, 31, 28, or 29. That number depends on what month I say. Agreed? Now, the only way you could argue this the other way is if I say 28 or 29, you know I'm speaking of February, yes? But for all the other months, it does not work. Everybody cool? All right, so we're comfortable with independent, dependent variable. Even if you're not quite, we're about to do four examples of what you're going to see. But you will notice I have highlighted two things, yes? The independent variable, we described what it is, and the domain are both highlighted in blue. The domain is the set of elements... that make up the IV, independent variable. I'm too lazy to write it. Everybody cool? So in this example that we've been working through, what is the domain in the months versus days relationship? What are the elements in the domain? Or the elements of the independent variable? The months. January, February, March, April, right? The range, obviously, is what? The set of elements that make up what? Yes, that make up the dependent variable. Now, in this white space at the bottom, we're going to do a little bit of work here. IV and domain are usually graphed on the x-axis. Which means they are usually x-values x values in an ordered pair. Please highlight usually. Now you being the intelligent young people that you are, the dependent variable and the range are therefore what? Are usually graphed on the y axis. So they are usually y values in the xy situation. So independent variable is made up of the values in the domain. The independent variable is also the input. Because like I said, in the function machine, if I drop the name of a month, January, you can tell me the output, yes? 31. Everybody cool? All right. So let's turn the page over and see if we've got this sorted. And so we will start with Sandy. First of all, let's change her hourly wage to 10 bucks an hour so it's easier to do the math. Okay, so let's identify the IV and the DV. Talk to your neighbor. First of all, what are the two things that are being counted here? Hours worked and? And her pay, yes? Okay, which of those is independent and which is dependent? Talk to your neighbor. Do not yell out an answer yet. Because you need to think about it. One of those two values depends on the other. All right. That was enough time to think for a bit. Which is independent? Who would like to volunteer? Mandaj? Um, uh, her pay is, uh, no, sorry, her hours are uh, independent. 
which makes her pay dependent. And that is absolutely correct. Because how much is on her paycheck depends upon the hours worked. Now, somebody always says, y'all, if you don't work, you don't get paid. So couldn't your hours depend on your pay? And I say, what are you doing right now? You are sitting here. Is our hours passing for you? Yeah. Are you being paid an hourly wage? No. no. So do you all understand what I mean? The hours are independent. Everyone is passing hours right now. But not everyone is getting paid for it. Everybody cool? All right. So we've got our IV and our DV. Now, what is our domain and range? Does the domain apply to the IV or the DV? Ivy, so what are my options for pay per week? Now, I'm going to make this easier on us because I don't want you to get stumbled in the math, okay? So we are going to pretend that our friend Sandy works at the greatest restaurant in the world that doesn't mess around, and you always get eight-hour shifts. Everybody understand? So... During a week, what are the options for Sandy to work? Is it possible she doesn't work at all in a week? Of course it is. So what would be the lowest amount of hours she could work in a week? Zero. Since her boss only gives eight-hour shifts, what, are the, what is the next value that could be in our domain? Eight. Then what? Then what? Then what? Then what? And why do we stop there? That's five days in a week. You get two days off. For the most part, labor laws are a little more complicated than that. But we're going to, for our purposes, for math purposes, that's the domain, right? Because she can only work eight-hour shifts and she can only work a maximum of five days a week. Yeah? Excellent. So what then is her pay? If she works zero hours. Uh, Ease, bees, lemon, squeezy, yeah? Is it a function? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Right. Each input, which was hours, gives a unique output, which was pay. There is no way to earn 160 bucks unless she works 16 hours, right? The boss isn't going to let her work eight hours and say, you know what, you take an extra 80 bucks, just because. Right? That's not how it works. Everybody cool? All right. So everybody can do it with a real life situation because it's easy, right? One depends on the other. So now we got to go to numbers. Now, as soon as you see numbers written that way, what do you know? That it's going on a graph, yeah? And what number goes first? Did you just say the first one? Where else would the first one go but first? <laughs> X, Y. Now, how did every teacher, when you were graphing, teach you to find these things? Really? Okay. Well, things have changed, because when I was your age, they just said, you go right or left on the X, and then up or down on the Y. That was how we were taught. End of discussion. Sometimes teachers said, have you ever played Battleship? Yeah. And you did A8, right? You went out on A, down to A, and that's how you found Miss, right? Okay. So, X's are our which? Input, output, domain, or range. What are they? Input. The X's are our input. So, X's are our independent variable. So, what is our domain in 4A? And I've been doing domain in black. 
What is our domain in 4A? 1, 2, 3, 4. Two, three, four. What is our range, which I think I was doing in red? Three, six, nine, twelve. Function or not? Why? Right. One relates to three. Two relates to six. Yeah? So this is indeed a function. Now, when we are writing out domains and range like this, we use these squiggly devil horn brackets. I know I don't usually give pet names of things, but I actually don't know what those brackets are called. I've never bothered to learn, so I just call them the squiggly brackets. I don't even bother drawing a properly. I just do this. Okay? I don't care. Everybody good? Easy peas, lemon squeezy, yeah? All right, that's what we do. And it's a function. So let's look at the next one. What's our domain? I'm going to change domain to blue. What's our domain? Okay, 1, 0, negative 1. Now, do you think I need to write 0 again? No. no, because I am not drawing or discussing the points on the graph. I am discussing the values that make up the domain, yes? I need the elements in the set. Everybody cool? Cool. All right, so there's squiggly, squiggly. Now, what is the range? Uh, zero, zero, one, one, one. Or, zero. You, you don't write the negative twice. Now, there's a couple of rules here. Write these in ascending order. What does that mean? So, let's rewrite these properly. Is the domain okay? Is the lowest number first? No. How would I write the domain properly? Negative 1, 0, 1. How would I write the range properly? Oh, negative 1, 0, 1. 0, 1. Now, once I've split them into, in do, into domain and range, are any of these pairs anymore? Yeah. Is 0, 0 one of the points? Yeah. Where? No. no. Is negative 1, negative 1 one of the points? No. So we have to remember. Domain and range are not ordered pairs anymore. An ordered pair has a domain value and a range value, but once I list them, you can't line them up that way. Everybody cool? Everybody cool? Now, let's check if it's a function or not. Which is the input? The domains in blue or the ranges in red? Domains in blue are the input. So let's check negative 1. What are the possible outputs if I input negative 1? Negative 1 goes to what output? Zero. Is that unique? Yeah. So if I just want negative one, it's a function, yeah? Okay. Zero goes to what? Zero goes to one and negative one. I input zero, but I get two different outputs. Are those two different outputs unique? No, obviously not, because there's two of them. So when I input zero, I get two outputs. So is this a relation or a function? This is a relation. Because of those light blue lines. Cool? All right. You people try C. You write the domain and the range, and then tell me if it's a relation or a function. Go. <sighs> um, 
Yo. Uh huh. So what's the domain? Uh, Who do we appreciate? Math, math, rah, rah, rah. What's the range? Or of course you do it backwards, the bad sportsman way that we used to do it when we won games. Eight, six, four, two, we enjoyed whipping you. I know, right? We were such badasses in 1985. Three, five, seven, nine. Now, relation or function? Function. Function, why? Because uh, two is equal to five, six, seven, eight. Right. Each output, each input has one output. Yeah? Okay. What is different on D? It's a graph, but what is each of those points on the graph? It's, an, it's a domain and range. It's an ordered pair, isn't it, Abnor? So this right here is just negative 3, 2, correct? Yeah. And you can do all the rest of them, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you guys tell me, what is the domain? And what is the range? Go. Who would like to volunteer the domain? RJ, hit me. Nicely done. But RJ, there's two dots at negative two. Why didn't you write negative two twice? Close. Once I split it into domain and range, what am I seeking? Again, close. Once I split into domain and range, does it matter about the ordered pairs? No, because I am just seeking the values that make up the set, the elements. Everybody cool? Okay, so what is the range? This is slight, this is trickier. Negative three. Negative three. You miss negative two. Everybody good? Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dots, but only six domain values and only six range values. Why? Mantoge? Because there's two dots that share the same domain value and two dots that share the same range value. Cool? Now, function or relation? relation. Why? At input of what? The input of this main yeah, which input? You're close. Just negative two. At input of negative two, we got two outputs. And that's not okay. Everybody cool? 
Okay, turn the page over, and then we are pro we're going to stop there. The vertical line test. First of all, I can't believe I have to do it, but I have to do it. What direction is vertical? Up and down. Okay. A vertical line test is we can use on graphs. Please highlight, underline, Mrs. Bad Crumble Cloud. It only works on graphs. And it works like this. If a vertical line touches the graph, the graphed data more than once, it's not a function. And here is what I mean. There's a graph, yes? Everyone agree? There's the x and y axis. Here's a line. Everyone agree? If I take a vertical line and I slide that line along the graph, son of a brother, brother. How many times does it hit the red line? Once, everywhere. No matter what X value it is, it only hits the red line once. Everybody with me? So that is a function. Right? Now, don't bother turning back a page. Just look up here. We already know this is a relation because we checked, right? But if I take that vertical line and I slide it along right there at negative 2, it hits, has two outputs. So that's not a function. Cool? Let's go to the, let's do another one. Function or not? Function. How many times does it hit the black curvy line? Once all the way along, yes? Okay, so there's another function. And lastly, hits it there and there, yes? So that's a relation. Everybody good? Ease, peas, lemon, squeezy, yeah? You get the rest of today off. And we will finish this up tomorrow because tomorrow we will also be going over your test. Okay? Who has not written the test from Friday? Just Vicky? All right, Vicky, you'll be writing that tomorrow. Take five minutes off.